Our thanks to Will Reeve. She was once considered one of the Democratic Party's rising stars. Katie Hill swept into office in the blue wave of the 2018 midterms, becoming one of the first openly bisexual members of Congress and flipping a Republican district in California. But months later, it all came crashing down. Last November, a conservative website published nude photos of her without her consent. She would resign weeks later in the middle of an ethics probe over a relationship with a campaign staffer. She's now the author of a new book called She Will Rise, and we're going to talk to her in just a moment. But first, we want to play you some of her speech on the day of her resignation about how she hoped her experience would empower other women. Yes, I'm stepping down. But I refuse to let this experience scare off other women who dare to take risks, who dare to step into this light, who dare to be powerful. It might feel like they won in the short term, but they can't in the long term. We cannot let them. The way to overcome this setback is for women to keep showing up, to keep running for office, to keep stepping up as leaders, because the more we show up, the less power they have. And former Congresswoman Katie Hill joins us now and is out with a new book, She Will Rise. The New York Times calling it Political Manifesto as Battle Plan, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but since you left office last year, you've started a political action committee to help elect women in office. So first off, speaking of a woman who dares to be powerful, I have to get your reaction to Joe Biden choosing Kamala Harris as VP, and, and welcome. Thank you. I, I was so excited uh, once Kamala Harris was announced. I was one of her early supporters as, in her presidential campaign. Um, so, you know, I, I would certainly have preferred a Harris-Biden ticket, but I will take Biden-Harris. And I know that she is exactly the kind of, um, you know, brings the, the energy and the leadership that we need right now to, to carry us through November. You've spoken repeatedly about a double standard that women face in politics and, and everywhere. Um, even in the lead up to being named VP, um, Kamala Harris was called too ambitious by men in her own party. Uh, and the president has called her nasty and a mad woman since her selection. What's your advice to her knowing what you've been through and, and what others have faced? Well, she's been in this business a lot longer than I have, so I don't think she needs my advice, but she's tough as nails, and that's what you have to be, right? You have to call it out every time you see it. Um, I think that within the media and within, uh, you know, the public sphere, just generally speaking, we've learned a lot since 2016, but we still have so far to go uh, in terms of the double standards that women are held to. So I hope, um, you know, and, and I talk about this so much in the book, that we can we can see that we are not going to use these kinds of terms um, if it, when it comes to male candidates or to um, you know no one's going to call Mike Pence too ambitious even if that was even if that's exactly what he was and so I think that uh, those are things that are socialized within us from you know from such an early age and we have to intentionally try to uh, try to stop ourselves from that and make sure that we're 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 fighting against it every step of the way. And often calling it out is half the battle. Now, we've seen many men come back from political and sex scandals. Why do you think women have a far more difficult time rebounding in that sphere? And what needs to happen, do you think, for that double standard to change? Sure. Well, women, first of all, we just don't have equal representation in office. So, you know, we're relatively new to the public, you know, to the, the sphere of, of running and, um, and leading in these seats. For example, in despite the whole year of the woman in 2018, we still make up 25% of Congress. That's half of what we should have if we were looking at, you know, proportional to our population. Um, so we are held to this higher standard of, of morality, of uh, performance, of, you know, uh, what's expected of us every step of the way. And I think that, you know, that doesn't totally change until we get to, to equal representation. Um, but the, the, the more important thing is that we have to, again, we have to look at that uh, each each time and say, is this is this how we would treat a man? And I think, you know, we're seeing that all the time, even with my own case, where um, I'm asked, you know, why haven't you apologized? Why haven't you taken accountability? I'm, I have, and how is there more accountability than stepping down? But also, if a man even apologizes a little bit, if he ever says anything about remorse or regret, he, it's, we're like, pl we're clapping for him. We're saying, oh my gosh, they, he, he actually apologized. He owned up for it. And yet here I am almost a year later having done all of these things and you still see that over and over again. And I'm just a fraction of an example for, um, you know, for, for women all over the place. So 
I don't think that that really will change until we get more women there, until we have younger women who, you know, whose lives have been exposed through social media, who's, who've lived their lives online. Um, and we can realize that people are human and we're going to make mistakes. And I hope that mine uh, don't don't discourage other women from running for office and, and don't reflect on all the women who um, who are going to come after. I know you told George Stephanopoulos in February that your relationship with a campaign staffer was absolutely my biggest mistake. Did you realize at the time that it was inappropriate and a potential risk to your whole political career? Or was it only after the photos and articles came out? And of course, looking back, what would you do differently? When it happened, um, it was so early on in the campaign and it was, you know, it didn't even seem like a possibility that, uh, that I was gonna get elected, to be honest with you. So yes, my life, my life um, ha was in a strange, a very strange place. My relationship was in a very strange place at that point. And I absolutely regret it. I regret not so setting those boundaries from the very beginning. Um, that's what, you know, of course that's what I would do over. But at the same time, I still, you know, I still care deeply about the woman that, um, that I was involved with. And I hope that um, her life is able to move on from, from everything that this has brought on her. Um, let's dig deeply into your book, uh, She Will Rise, which we should mention is out this week. I want to read a passage about those difficult, dark days after the photos were released. Um, you wrote, I would start shaking, crying, throwing up. It was hard to talk to my family because I knew they were going through so much, too. I didn't want to talk to my friends because I was humiliated. I didn't want to hear more pity, and I just didn't know what to say. Um, you even write that you had suicidal thoughts. Um, how hard is it still to talk about all this? And, and was this book a way of helping you with healing? Yeah, but going through the process of writing the book was absolutely a, a way for me to, you know, to work through a lot of this. And I, I got to be honest with you, you know, I've done I've done a lot of interviews in this past week kind of leading up to the launch and, and after the book has been published. And I, every single day you feel worn out from talking about it over and over again. And um, you know, it's, it's re-traumatizing. Um, I've had a, a really traumatic year in a lot of other ways, too. My, my brother passed away suddenly in January, just two months after I had to resign. My mom had brain surgery. And of course, you know, all of us are going through the trauma of 2020. Um, so it kind of, it put, it did put things into perspective. Um, but it's, I think it, you know, what I've, what I've really learned is that um, I need to find a way personally to make meaning of the things that have happened to me and to uh, to find a way of of trying to you know really do something with my life from here and and try to make sure that this is not this what happened to me last year and and the mistakes that i've made um, are not what define me as a person and that it's a blip in my life instead of you know the entire thing that um that i'm remembered for that is a lot of loss to sustain in one year and i'm so sorry for your loss um i do want to get to your message in the book to women what what message do you have to them with, as they're facing the prospect of either getting involved in politics or, or perhaps even running for office the message is it's pretty simple we are as women just existing in day-to-day -day society we are already warriors in this fight whether we want to be or not we are um we are living through these systems that have that continually oppress and and hold us back one in four women is going to experience or has experienced some kind of sexual violence in her lifetime this, the numbers just on everything are staggering equal pay is impossible to achieve the poverty um, that that women face is is completely unequal, and so you know my my real point with the book is that it's going to take us truly standing up and claiming our place in this fight and saying that we're not going to put up with it anymore. And we know we have a plan, we have a battle plan. We've got uh, we know that the first thing that we have to do is to elect women to get uh, to the place of equal representation, and once you know, and even before then, but also once women are there, there is there is a set of, of you know, legislation that is gonna have a tremendous uh, impact on all of these different systemic barriers, but that needs to be prioritized. And I don't believe will be truly prioritized until we have enough women um, holding positions of power. Well, Katie Hill, we heard it from you first. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. And your new book out now is She Will Rise. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.